Hello and welcome to today's live session, Life Cycle Cost Assessments of Pressure Sewer Systems. I'm Rachel Seiler, today's host and Marketing Communications Manager for E1. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping notes. All attendee lines have been muted. We'll be recording today's session and an archived edition will be available on E1's website and our YouTube channel. Upon successful completion of today's webinar, you'll receive a PDF of the presentation a copy of the life cycle cost calculator, as well as a certificate of attendance. And finally, we'd love to hear from you. We've allotted about 10 minutes of Q&A during today's session, so please make use of this time. If we don't get to all your questions, we'll answer them in a follow-up email. So now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Keith McHale. Keith is a professional engineer licensed in Maryland, Virginia, Connecticut, and New Hampshire with 30 years in manufacturing and consulting engineering focused in wastewater collection and treatment. As a consulting engineer, Keith's projects involved evaluation, planning and design of wastewater collection systems and treatment and disposal facilities. Keith, take it away. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you all for attending. Um, our, our webinar today is on the life cycle cost assessment of pressure sewer systems. I think um, you know, it's important that when we look at the implementation of a major infrastructure project with an objective of providing a high level of responsibility to the stakeholders in our current environment of limited resources, it really requires consideration of not only the near-term capital costs, but also the long-term costs associated with the future operation, maintenance, and repair of the system. So life cycle cost analysis is an invaluable tool to evaluate the economic favorability of alternative wastewater collection systems or individual components of the systems. So our, our agenda today is uh, pretty straightforward. We're going to do a really brief overview just to identify uh, alternative wastewater collection systems, the uh, four primary ones. And then uh, to kind of discuss the evaluation of the alternatives and looking at a structured life cycle cost analysis. So when I look at the second and third bullets, they're kind of intermingled throughout my uh, presentation. So I'll kind of, you know, be talking about the evaluation of alternatives and then that structured approach to it. <clears throat> so we'll start with some of the basics. Um, when we look at wastewater very linear infrastructure, wastewater collection system, we have uh, you know, several options available uh, to us. The uh, main one that you know, everyone is probably familiar with, been around for uh, quite a while, would be a conventional gravity sewer system. Conventional gravity sewer system consists of the mainline pipe, service laterals going from the household to the mainline pipe, uh, manholes that would be located every 400 to 500 feet of straight run, and at any point you have a terminal mainline segment or a change in direction. Uh, a, a gravity sewer works by a constant downward, sl uh, downward slope in pipe to allow the wastewater to move under the force of gravity. So as that pipe becomes uh, uh, very deeper and deeper, as the excavation gets deeper, it becomes uneconomical to continue deep in and actually both uneconomical and uh, unsafe to dig very deep trenches. So then a gravity sewer system might need to incorporate some lift stations uh, throughout the system. So again, this is, you know, the, the gravity sewer system has been around forever. Now we look at the, another alternative, another option for wastewater collection is pressure sewer systems with grinder pumps. A pressure sewer system consists of the individual grinder pumps located at each property and a small diameter pipe. So as the wastewater enters the, the basin from the household, the wastewater or the solids are ground up and then the wastewater with the ground solids are discharged into the small diameter mainline sewer um, and then conveyed to either the wastewater treatment plant or could be even conveyed to a, a lift station or a gravity sewer as part of a larger wastewater collection system. So as I mentioned, you know, this is um, just kind of a, qu a quick overview of what is the heart of a pressure sewer system. Uh, my the webinar today is really focused on the life cycle cost assessments of sewer systems. Uh, 
So I'm not going to go into a lot of the features and benefits of the grinder pump, the one grinder pump itself. If you do have any questions and you need other information, please feel free to contact anyone at E1 or any, if you know your uh, local distributor, uh, you feel free to contact them. We can get just more details on the actual features and benefits. All I'm really going to address right now is kind of the, the quick overview. Where, as I said, you have the grinder pump located at each property. And the system consists of the pump basin, the pump, which could be either a progressive cavity pump in the, ca in the case of an E1 system or a centrifugal pump. And then you have your liquid level sensors, uh, something to tell the pump to turn on and off based on the wastewater level in the basin. The pump controls to actually turn the pumps on and off. And then some means of pump removal guidance. So, you know, with the E1 system, everything is on this one E1 core. And that core sits in a funnel within the basin. If you're looking at a centrifugal grinding pump system, you're probably going to see more of a, a guide rail type system that you would typically see on a larger lift station. Um, so again, the, the wastewater comes into the system, um, grinds up the material, the, or I'm sorry, the solids are ground up and then discharged with the semi-positive displacement. Uh, progressive cavity action and then discharges uh, to a small diameter pipe to the lateral. Uh, in the street, the lateral, I mean, I'm sorry, the mainline sewer will typically be about two to four inch, very flexible pipe. And because the wastewater is conveyed under the force of the gr individual grinder pumps, it's not critical that the pipe be laid at a constant downward slope that you would have for a gravity sewer system. So the mainline sewer and the pressure sewer system can follow the contours of the land and be buried just below the frost line. Have a couple other sewer alternatives. I'm not gonna go into any real, re -de any real detail other than what you see on this slide right here. But you can also have a, what's known as a septic tank effluent pump system. And that could be also a variation on that is a septic tank effluent gravity system. Uh, this system consists of a septic tank at each property. Wastewater from the property enters the septic tank. The solids settle out, so it provides that primary settling. And then the wastewater effluent is conveyed either by gravity in the case of a steg system or by pumps in the case of a step system. And similar to a grinder pump basin, a small diameter pipe, it can be discharged to the treatment plant or to uh, part of an existing uh, gravity sewer system to a lift station. Now, one of the things to consider on a step or stag sewer is that only the effluent is conveyed. The wastewater characteristics in that case are gonna be a little bit different than what you would have with any other wastewater collection system. So if you're discharging a step or a stag sewer to an existing gravity sewer system to a lift station or to the treatment plant, you wanna make sure that uh, the septicity of the effluent does not create a problem with the existing system. And then the fourth basic uh, wastewater collection system is a vacuum sewer. In a vacuum sewer, the prime driver of the wastewater is the suction of a vacuum that is created at a centralized vacuum pumping station. So there's a constant vacuum within the system. Wastewater flows from the property and is stored in holding pits at each location. A sensor is prompted, which causes a pneumatic valve to open. And because the system is always under a vacuum, the wastewater is pulled or sucked from the pit into the collection system. Now with the vacuum system, it's very critical that the pipe is installed in a very strict manner. It's installed in a, um, a sawtooth pattern where one segment of pipe goes downhill for a little bit, then it has a little uphill segment. So you have that, um, uh, segmentation, sawhill pattern of it. So it's, it's kind of when you look at the alternatives of sewer systems, there's some similarity between a vacuum sewer and a gravity sewer system and that it is very critical that the pipe be installed at very tight uh, tolerances in a downward uh, direction. So there we have, you know, four standard wastewater collection systems. So if a municipality or an engineer or utility is looking at uh, selecting the best 
the most appropriate wastewater collection system for their community, they would typically go through an alternatives evaluation. And when we look at these alternatives, you, you, can, you can break it down into two categories. There's the objective analysis and the subjective analysis. Now the objective analysis is pretty straightforward. Uh, performance criteria and economic criteria. Can this system get the wastewater from point A to point B, the performance criteria, and can it do it economically feasible manner, the economic criteria? So that's one of the things you look at. But then with every system, there's also the subjective analysis. It's non-monetary non criteria that we're talking about here. And you know, as, as we know from subjective analysis, it's subjective. Everybody has an opinion. So this is some of the stuff that you want to look at the various sewer alternatives and see how it best fits into uh, the solution. And on a project design team or project evaluation team, it wouldn't be uncommon to people to evaluate things differently. But on the subjective analysis, what we generally look at is the suitability, how the uh, particular wastewater collection option fits in with the community, the ease of operation and maintenance, how familiar is the operator with the system or the maintenance personnel, what are the community impacts? And there can be a very long list of subjective alternatives. So when we look at the selection, going through, say we, we want to put in a new system and we're going to break it down to a gravity grinder pump step or vacuum system, it's not uncommon for the engineer, the owners, or whatever other stakeholders to establish some sort of collection ma or selection matrix. And here we would break it down into the monetary and the non-monetary non or the subjective criteria. You know, I you know, already went through all the components. And on this illustration I have here, you know, this is just for illustration purposes, a, a short bar would be less favorable, a long bar would be more favorable. When, you, when, you, when a, a utility, an engineer, or any stakeholder is looking at their alternatives for wastewater collection, it's not uncommon to set it up with this sort of selection matrix where you could evaluate uh, different criteria, the monetary and the non-monetary evaluation criteria as favorable or less favorable. Now, as I say, in this example, the shorter bars would be less favorable, the longer bars would be more favorable. Think of it as a scale of one to 10, with 10 being better than <clears> one. <throat> now, if you're looking at an evaluation, it is very critical to know what the key is because I've seen a lot of reports where uh, the shorter bar would be more favorable, a lower rating, like it's a golf score, I guess, a lower rating would be more favorable. So you just wanna look at you know, these alternatives. And today, it really comes down kind of the focus on the monetary, the capital cost and the O&M cost. Those are really uh, you know, the key ones you want to look at, and then you want to see how, other, how it fits into the system. But even if we focus only on the monetary cost, it's still not uncommon that those uh, non-monetary subjective uh, criteria could get involved too. Because when we look at stuff uh, or topics such as suitability, ease of operation, uh, community impact, such <clears> as <throat> up the street, those have a cost associated with them. So here we'll kind of say, okay, so we want to look at our alternatives and we're going to focus on the capital costs. And really the best way to do that is through a life cycle cost analysis. Now life cycle cost analysis evaluates all current and future costs necessary to construct, operate, maintain a sewer system. Uh, and you have a couple ways to break this down. So the two key components of the life cycle costs are the capital expenditures and the operational expenditures. Capital expenditures are your uh, engineering cost, the construction cost, and the project administration cost. Your operation expenditures would be your operations, your maintenance, and your repair and replacement cost. And you can see I have a little asterisk on the replacement cost because the replacement cost is really could be construed as a capital cost. It depends on how the utility is set up. If you have to replace a pump in 10 years, it could be handled as a new capital expenditure or be handled as an operational expenditure. It's really gonna vary uh, depending on the utility. 
but I, I kind of put it down in the OPEX because you also want to break down the life cycle cost evaluation into the current cost and to the future cost. So even if an equipment replacement is a capital expenditure, it's a capital expenditure that occurs in the future. So we would treat it as an operation expenditure for the case of a life cycle cost analysis. Why it's important to do a life cycle cost analysis? Here we go, it wasn't advancing. The life cycle cost analysis provides a structured approach to evaluate in sewer systems. So you're able to look at it and make sure you do everything uh, the same way for each evaluation. You don't wanna evaluate a gravity sewer differently from a monetary standpoint than you would a low pressure sewer system. So you would like something structured that provides that standard of the alternatives. Also, you wanna provide a long-term assessment of the infrastructure project compared to evaluating only the initial capital cost. But as an industry, one of the uh, traps we fell into uh, a few decades back, particularly when there was a lot of federal grant money available, is a lot of projects were selected and uh, based on the lowest construction cost up front, only focusing on the capital cost. Then you fast forward a couple of decades or even less than a couple of decades, and many utilities find that they're struggled or they weren't quite budget it properly to handle the ongoing operation and maintenance of these wastewater treatment and collection alternatives. So it's important that when you're doing an evaluation of wastewater infrastructure and what we're focused on today, the uh, collection part of that infrastructure, it's important that we look at all the cost, both the near-term capital construction cost, the near-term or the uh, a little bit less near term capital cost associated with repairing any components, and then the future cost associated with the ongoing repair and operation and maintenance of the infrastructure. So a life cycle cost analysis compares all the alternatives on equal footing. We're evaluating apples to apples. And, and you know, one, one of the key reasons it's important is because somebody is making a decision to spend a lot of money on a wastewater collection system. So this provides the decision makers with the information they need to make the responsible decisions, not only for the community and the utility, but also for the rate payers who will ultimately be uh, the ones ha handling the uh, burden of the financial cost. So when we look at a, a life cycle cost, you know, it's a pretty straightforward process. And what you want to do is you want to take all costs associated with the wastewater collection system and convert them to a present value. So these costs would include the initial construction cost. And part of that initial construction cost would also be the initial project cost. The initial project cost would be the uh, engineering, the uh, project administration for the municipality or util utility to oversee the project, any legal or other administrative cost, and then perhaps uh, the project construction oversight or the commissioning. Then your future costs would be your operation and maintenance. Your, your, what I'm saying here is the subset O and M. And then the future repair and replacement cost. Now, I, I mentioned a couple slides back that when you're looking at the replacement cost, that could be considered a capital cost. Because let's say you have a, a, a large wastewater lift station as part of a gravity sewer system. And every 10 years, you have to replace a component, uh, maybe not the pump, but you have to do a, a pretty significant replacement of a piece of equipment within that uh, lift station. So that would occur at year let's say 5, 10, 15, 20, it's a capital cost. Uh, what I find makes it kind of easy and simplifies the evaluation is to treat that capital expenditure in the future as a recurrent cost. So kind of treat it as an operation and maintenance cost. Uh, the same would be said for uh, a low pressure sewer system that if you, if you want to replace or if you were looking to replace the grinder pump in a low pressure sewer system at year 20 and you're doing a 40 year life cycle cost analysis, you, could take, you don't want to necessarily look at that capital cost in your 20 and bring it forward. You can spread that out over the course of the 20 years and treat it as a recurrent cost. It makes the calculation a little bit easier and really doesn't change 
uh, the evaluation results because you are just doing a comparative analysis. So you have you know, pretty standard economic formulas that are used for this, uh, the present value. And you'll, you know, you'll see me go kind of back and forth between present value, net present value, and present worth. They're all essentially the same thing. They're just bringing all cost into the present value or today's dollars. So with our construction cost and our initial project cost, it's pretty simple. We'll just assume that those are in current year dollars because that's what we're doing the evaluation now. But when we look at our future cost, um, and that would be the second formula down, the PV equals A. That's you know the O&M, the replacement cost, the repair, that's an annuity, that's an annual cost. So that, that brings all the annual cost using what is known as the uh, uniform series present worth equ equation, it takes all those future costs and brings them forward to a present day value. So you have costs in year one, year two, year three, all the way up to year N. Those annual costs are all brought forward with the life cycle present worth analysis to the current year values. And it does this, there are you know, basically two values that are used to develop the factor. The discount rate, which is the cost of money, and the number of periods, and that would usually be in years. So for most life cycle cost analysis, we'd be looking at about, uh, I like to use 30 years, but typically you would be somewhere between 20 and 40 years. One of the things that's gonna typically drive the number of periods or how long you do a life cycle cost evaluation is the uh, funding source. If you're getting a grant funding or funding from a government agency and it's a 20 year loan or 30 year loan or it has some sort of uh, time period in it, the life cycle cost analysis is usually done over a life cycle period to match the funding period. So again, with the present worth, uniform series present worth rather, it takes all those future costs and brings those forward into our present value. So when we look at the present worth system, or when we look at a present worth evaluation, it's important that we get a real good handle on the process. It's a pretty simple, straightforward process, but you want to make sure you have everything established early on so that you're looking at it all in the same lens. As I said, the, the key advantage of a life cycle cost analysis is to have, have a structured approach. So you want to make sure you establish both your system parameters and the financial parameters as you go through the process. Uh, you know, a lot of this is repeating what I've already said, but your system parameters when you're doing the life cycle cost analysis, your initial cost, your initial construction cost, including the project cost. Also, you want to identify and quantify the activities frequency and cost associated with the operation, maintenance, repair, and replacement of the wastewater collection system. And then you also want to kind of have an idea when you're doing electric cost analysis for a wastewater collection system on the projected wastewater flows. They don't necessarily feed into the um, electric cost analysis directly, but they could influence some of the decisions, particularly if you're looking at uh, comparing a low pressure sewer system versus a gravity sewer system. In a gravity sewer system, you have infiltration and inflow. That's going to add a cost to the evaluation because once infiltration and inflow enters the system, it has to be transported to the wastewater treatment plant and treated as if it were uh, wastewater itself. With the low pressure sewer system, you don't have any infiltration and inflow. So when you look at the two systems from an economic standpoint, you want to make sure that the process is set up so it captures all the costs, including those costs associated with infiltration and inflow. Then you also want to establish your financial parameters. These are pretty simple and you can find a lot of information. Uh, the lending agency might tell you what these parameters would be. They might give you a discount rate to use. Um, but here you have your cost escalation rate that if you, have, if you want to inflate any cost to a, from present value to a future value, you have that. Uh, the way I do life cycle cost analysis, I don't escalate everything. I use a discount rate that takes into account the impacts of um, inflation. And that's the discount rate. So that's, that's the uh, inflation, inflation interest rate. That's the cost of money. Then you have, as I already mentioned, the project planning period. So when you're looking at a present worth analysis, it's really important that the process be set up 
so that you are doing a fair comparative analysis between each of the systems. But you also want something that makes it easier for the user. You want a lifecycle cost process that is repeatable. You want someone in office in the one office to be doing the same process that somebody in another office is doing. Uh, you want to be flexible. You know, I always, I always like the line, uh, you know, all politics are local. It's the same for all wastewater collection. What you have in one area is not what's going to be the same, uh, similar in another area. So you want to make sure that uh, the lifecycle cost process is flexible to meet your needs in your area. And that kind of ties into the other uh, uh, point, lo localized. What works up in New York isn't the same as what works in Arkansas or Colorado or Washington State. And then, you know, my background, I, as I think Rachel mentioned in my introduction, prior to coming to E1, uh, I was a consultant engineer. And I learned really early on as a young engineer that when I do an evaluation, someone's going to challenge me on those numbers. So you want to make sure that the life cycle cost uh, evaluation is, you can defend it. You know, you, everyone might have a different opinion, but you want to make sure that you can defend your opinion. If somebody has a different opinion, then yeah, that's a point of discussion and maybe there can be some tweaking there. But you want to make sure that what you say and when you put together this evaluation that you can defend it. So like I said, the keys really repeatable, flexible, localized, and defensible. A nice way to set that up is a spreadsheet-based lifecycle cost analysis model. Spreadsheet-based model provides the ease of use. It's, you can set it up uh, and guide you through it. It provides that consistency so that everyone is doing things the same way. It provides the structure, the flexibility. You're able to defend by having that report and having that process that says, well, here's how we determine the lifecycle cost analysis. Here's the process that makes it a little bit easier to defend. And also provide some guidance. Because a lot of time now, you know, I've talked to people and as an engineer, I used to do life cycle cost evaluations and there may be no malice intended, but sometimes when we're doing an evaluation, we forget things. You know, maybe, you know, one of the common things you might hear is uh, there's really no operation maintenance costs associated with a, a gravity sewer system. That's not the case. Gravity sewer systems need maintenance to, Sewer systems need to be evaluated, inspected, cleaned, rehabilitated from time to time. Now, if someone doesn't include then in the um, process evaluation, it doesn't mean that they necessarily meant to ignore it, but they just needed to be reminded that no, there are costs associated with it. With every process, there's a cost, and you want to make sure that you kind of capture that. And the nice thing with the life cycle cost model is it gives you that little nudge to say, hey, did you think about this? So now I'm kind of going to go through, and what we have, we, uh, E1 has uh, the lifecycle cost analysis that is available on our website. I think as follow up to this webinar, uh, the Marcom group is going to send out a link so you can download this free uh, software. As I said, it's a spreadsheet based software and, and do the system, do an evaluation. So now I'm kind of going, this is where I kind of combine the two points where I'm going to talk about the lifecycle cost assessment and intertwine it with the spreadsheet spreadsheet excuse me spreadsheet based lifecycle cost model. So important thing to know about a lifecycle cost model. We want to know, we want to make sure we understand rather what it is and what it is not. A lifecycle cost model is a planning level tool to provide an assessment on the evaluation of the total cost of ownership for sewer alternatives. It's really the starting point of an evaluation where you don't have a lot of information. You're just trying to make the decision process between A, B, C, and D, or maybe just A and B. So you don't have a lot of information. Therefore, the costs are gonna be based on little information. So it's really just a planning level tool to get you in the ballpark. It's intended only for comparison purposes only. That's true if it were based on this E1 life cycle cost model, or if you were sitting down with a piece of paper and an RS means cost book to come up with a quick number, you know, the back of the envelope calculation. You just want to see what is feasible at this stage, and we'll go further as we decide what to do and we'll refine those costs. 
So that's what it is. And that leads into what it is not. It is not a 100% design opinion of probable construction cost and should not be used for project budget and purposes. When you're looking at a wastewater collection system, you're not gonna know what the opinion of probable construction cost is going to be until you have design drawings greater than, let's say 75%. And then you're really not gonna have a great, you know, you're not gonna be comfortable with that number until you have 90%, 100% construction drawings. So at this stage, when you're just doing that initial evaluation to see, do I wanna use a pressure sewer system instead of a gravity sewer system? You're just doing that first pass. You don't want to budget, use it for budgeting because you're going to get better information as the project progresses and as you learn more, but you just want to see if it's feasible. You know, it, it goes back to a lesson I learned, I think as a five-year engineer, council person asks you, well, don't have this, live by this, but just give us an idea of what it's going to cost. And I was told never to do that because that's what goes into the plan and budget for next year. And then you're held to that cost. So you want to know when you do a less of cost analysis, what it really is and what it isn't. So if you set up the last cost analysis or you use the E1 model, you can go through and put in the fields to establish those financial parameters. Again, the cost escalation rate, the um, discount rate, or the planning period. And I, I pretty much mentioned this, but the planning period should cover the full analysis or that the analysis should cover all the cost incurred over the period. So you want to make sure that the planning period is optimized so that it captures not only the near term capital cost, but also the long term cost. As I mentioned earlier, 20 to 40 years is typical. I like to use 30. Anything less than 20 years, you're not capturing the real operation maintenance costs of the system. Anything over 40 years, then you're just guessing on what is already a guess. You know, we don't know what's going to be happening uh, 40 years from now. If somebody asked me four months ago what today was going to be like, I never would have guessed this. So going 40 years out, you know, you're really just kind of uh, put in a, a guess on top of a guess. So like I said, typical number, 30 years. And again, with the elastic cost analysis, all you're doing is comparing alternatives. You're not developing a budget. So if there is some error in our financial selections, it's going to translate to all processes. Okay, then you also want to establish the system parameters, the initial capital, construction costs, and the project cost. With the life cycle cost model, it kind of walks you through the process. So again, it guides you, it reminds you of things you need to look at, things you want to consider. Maybe you don't want to consider in the evaluation, the engineering, project administration, the oversight or the commissioning. Maybe the utility says, well, that's going to be about the same for all alternatives. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't come down to a critical component. So when we look at the comparison, this is a, a graph we developed where we looked at a lot of reports and a lot of bid tabs comparing pressure sewer system to gravity sewer system. And you know, our, our experience has, has shown that the average cost savings of low pressure sewer over gravity is on average about 35%. We've seen some projects where it's almost a 50% savings or even a 60% cost savings over gravity sewer system. So these are, as I said, these are some data points that we pulled on a cost per connection basis uh, comparing the two alternatives. And you can see the basic trend line where the pressure sewer system capital construction cost does tend to be lower than the gravity system. And of course, you're going to have some places where gravity is low and pressure is high. But when you look at the trend lines, you can see where the pressure sewer system is about 35% lower than the gravity sewer system. And this, you know, it's, it's kind of easy once you walk through the process and you really start to try to understand the construction cost drivers. With the gravity sewer systems, you have large diameter pipe, deep excavations, large environmental disturbance. With pressure sewer systems, you have smaller pipe diameters. This means you have shallow excavations that follow the contours of the land or trenchless insulation methods could be used. We've also done another uh, tabletop evaluation looking at a whole lot of study and bid tabs. Uh, um, pressure sewer systems from all manufacturers I mean, these are public bid tabs, so I'm not even sure who the manufacturer is. But when we looked at this evaluation, we found that about 94% of all pipe for a pressure sewer system is four inch diameter or less. 
Compare that to an eight inch diameter pipe minimum for a gravity sewer that's gonna be buried deeper. And it would just make sense intrinsically that the pressure sewer system is gonna be cheaper. With the gravity sewer systems, you have the possibility of multiple lift stations, uh, extensive restoration, both in the lift station area as well as the uh, roadway where you're putting in the gravity sewer system and the potential for high dewatering cost. With pressure sewer systems, depending on how the system is structured, sized, and laid out, there would be few, if any, lift stations. You have a smaller equipment, smaller crews, less environmental disturbance. So you got smaller equipment with smaller crews that are gonna be laying more pipe per day than they would be able to do with the gravity sewer system. So again, intrinsically, that's just gonna say pressure sewer system would be much cheaper, significantly cheaper. Also with uh, pressure sewer systems, you have a lot more flexibility in the construction phase in and the project phase in itself. So when you're looking at it, uh, and this is just for illustration, I'm not gonna go over this, but when you're looking at elastic cost evaluation, we wanna establish the initial capital cost. You wanna make sure you capture the pipe the air, on a pressure sewer system, the pipe, the air release valves, the grinder pump basin on a gravity sewer system. You want to capture the pipe, the manholes, are there lift stations, what are the service laterals? So by having this structure, you make sure you're capturing everything. Because again, remember at the early stages, you don't know a lot. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so this kind of guides you through and gives you the process of, oh yeah, maybe I am going to have um, a lift station. I don't know, I might. Maybe I am going to have a couple of air release valves on the pressure sewer systems. Maybe, maybe not. Once I get uh, more refined design. I can tweak that, but let me just put some numbers in there now for planning. Now, another thing too we looked at when, when we were doing our tabletop evaluation is the capital cost comparison. Now, when we compare a gravity sewer to a pressure sewer system, we got uh, really five main components. You got your public sewer mains, the sewer appurtenances. These are your uh, manholes, cleanouts, air release valves, isolation valves, all the on-property work, service lateral for a gravity sewer, the pump basin for a um, pressure sewer system, lift stations, uh, restoration. So we did an evaluation, and this was done primarily looking at third-party engineering reports. It's hard to get this sort of information based on bid tabs because one, you're not comparing A to B. You know, once you go to design and construction, you're only down to one system. So this comes from a lot of reports, and what we found is uh, the, the, the cost breakdown on gravity sewer, the mainline sewer was responsible for about 43% of the total cost versus 33% of the total cost for um, pressure sewer system. Then on, lift, on the gravity sewer system, lift stations, looking at all these project evaluations, in some cases, bid tabs, lift stations accounted for 21% of the um, cost for the gravity sewer system versus 2% for the pressure sewer system. Uh, appurtenances for gravity system, 9%. So if you just look at this, you can see that on a gravity sewer system, most of the cost is the upfront cost of putting in the mainline sewer, the manholes, and the lift stations. Whereas if you look at a pressure sewer system with grinder pumps, the mainline, the public work, the stuff that's on the roads, the mainline sewer, the air release valves if there are any, the cleanouts if there are any, uh, what few if any lift stations there are, is less than 47% uh, of the total cost. The on-property component, as we would expect, is going to be high with the pressure sewer system. Now what makes this sort of nice when you're looking at a capital cost analysis is if you're looking at the community, say you're going from a septic system to a centralized sewer system, and not every homeowner has to commit or has to connect. If you look at a pressure sewer system, you're gonna expend a lot less capital dollars early on for the mainline sewer. And then later as the homeowner connects, then you'll start to see that accrual of the 53% of the on property. Once the basin is installed on the property, that's when that cost is incurred. So when you're looking at the evaluation, you, know, you, do also, you wanna make sure it's feasible, it works, we also can look at the phasing. You know, if I go with the pressure sewer system versus the gravity sewer system, some of my capital cost could be deferred in the future years. I'll bring them back, and from a lifecycle cost analysis, it's all going to be brought back to present worth dollars. So you may not necessarily see it in the present worth evaluation, 
But when you're doing the evaluation, you could say, the utility can say, we don't have to spend all the money year one for a grinder pump system. Some of that money is going to be spent year five, year six, year seven. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're doing that evaluation as well. Even though you're bringing all the money to present worth value, it's not all going to be occurred at present year values. So then, okay, so then we want to establish the system parameters looking at operation, equipment, maintenance, equipment repair, and replacement. And again, you would go through the model and establish the activities, the frequency, and the cost. And again, with the E1 system, that's why I say this is sort of the guidance and the reminder. There is a cost in here for um, pressure sewer cleanout. With an, with an E1 system, you don't really have any um, uh, preventive maintenance, but you do have maintenance maybe with the power or the recurring uh, reactive maintenance and equipment replacement. With the gravity sewer system, you want to be reminded that, yeah, most systems do require that you have to maintain them. You know, a well-planned and executed maintenance program is key to keeping the sewer system in good repair. There is no uh, free lunch. Maintenance is required for all wastewater collection systems. One of the things we hear a lot is gravity sewer system is nice. Yeah, it costs more up front, but once it's in, you don't have to worry about it. There is no maintenance. There is maintenance. You have maintenance on every system. Proactive maintenance in some cases, reactive maintenance in probably all cases. As I mentioned with E1, there is no real proactive maintenance, but it is a piece of mechanical equipment, so there might be some reactive maintenance. So it's important when you do a life cycle cost analysis that you capture everything everything. On a gravity sewer system, regular inspection and cleaning is necessary to prevent blockages in the sewer main, reduces the chances of backup and overflows. Uh, generally, there is no guidance. So in our life cycle cost model, you can see there are fields that account for how much of the system might be uh, TV inspected, how much we smoke test it. And this is, again, where, where I mentioned earlier, defensible. These are things to remind the user that you should consider these costs. These costs costs are necessary for a well-operated gravity sewer system. Somebody can go in there and zero out the frequency and the cost, and that's sort of the decision, and if that can be defended, that's fine. But you want to make sure you're able to defend it. And that's why I said the nice thing about the less cost model is it gives you that guidance to say, hey, did you think about this? But also gives you the flexibility to change any value or any parameter to a value that you like. So when we look at the operation and maintenance, there is no regulatory or industry standard. It is often driven, driven by consent or decrease. So I just pulled some information uh, looking at frequency. And you can see that you know, EPA recommends CCTV inspection, 7.8% of the system per year, manhole inspection, about 20% of the system. And there are costs associated with that. So this EPA report I pulled this from was a little bit dated, by, but I did adjust the costs to current year dollars. And you can see that, you know, when you look at hydro flushing, you know, dollars per year per mile, that's about $8,000 per year per mile. And if you go into an evaluation looking at just the capital cost and don't plan for, don't account for the operation and maintenance costs, that $8,000 per mile can bite you pretty quickly once you get down there, you know, $17,000 per mile per year uh, for TV inspection. Those are real costs, things to consider. Also, you have the gravity sewer O&M at lift stations. They require regular inspections. You know, you have daily or weekly visits just to make sure everything is okay. Quarterly mechanical and electrical inspection and maintenance, wet wall cleaning that's required. Plus you have the power, the odor control, chemicals, landscaping, all associated with life cycle or lift station maintenance. So you wanna make sure when you do a life cycle cost analysis that you include this operation and maintenance component within there. Now, on the other side of that, when we look at pressure sewer O&M, kind of a, a misconception is that it's a lift station. It's going to require a lot of O&M, and it really doesn't. As I said, with the, with the E1 system, because it is a semi-positive displacement, one horsepower pump, there is no real preventative maintenance required of it, and the mean time between service is greater than 10 years typically. On the mainline pipe, uh, this is true for E1 systems as well as any other pressure system that we're aware of. There's not a lot of uh, O&M required for the mainline pressure sewer. The wastewater is ground down and conveyed through the system, so you don't have as much stuff settling out. Plus, with the E1 system being a semi-positive displacement pump, it has a 
tendency to create a, what we call a self scouring velocity, that even if you have solids that settle, eventually the characteristics of the semi-positive displacement pump will push that, uh, so, those solids forward. So it's very insignificant cost with uh, the O&M mainline sewer. When we look at the uh, pressure sewer O&M from the pump side, here I can only speak to the E1 system, the progressive cavity grinder pump, because that's the data that we have available. But it is similar to any major household appliance. Uh, anyone who sat in on a couple of the other webinars that our, our Marcom team has put together this uh, last few months probably saw you know, where we came from. The E1 system was developed by a group of GE engineers. Engineers, a company used to develop in major household appliances. So it is similar to a household appliance. It has that household appliance mentality. Life expectancy, 15 to 20 years. And as I mentioned, the mean time between service for an SPD pump is about 10 years, a little bit greater in most cases. Cost of ownership, electricity, less than $25 per year. And if you look at replacing the pump or what the actual maintenance cost of the pump is, if you look at a collection of pumps, we have studies that show the annualized pump maintenance is about $30 to $50 per uh, installed pump per year. So we kind of walked through this, and as I mentioned, the um, life cycle cost analysis the tool that E1 developed is a free tool available from E1. It provides the evaluation of the various sewer alternatives. Um, the default setting is to evaluate gravity and pressure sewer system, but you could also use it to evaluate E1, gravity, septic tank effluent pump systems, and vacuum systems. Very little information is required uh, it provides a quick analysis based on just the number of connections and the distance between connections. The model is set up. If you tell it how many connections you have and what the distance is between those connections, it estimates the total length of pipe. And in the case of pressure sewer systems, the various diameters and length of uh, the various segments. So it's used to calculate the conceptual level of the pipe and then provides the flexibility. So it gives you the standard parameters that you have but every parameter, both economic and system parameter, can be changed. This is the defensibility part. So this eliminates any perceived bias. It was developed by E1, so it has our defensibility in it, but if the user wants to change a value, they could. Also, if you're familiar with our tool, we do have a new version that is uh, coming out now where you have the ability to put in non-standard system components. So the model is set up for your standard system components, two inch pipe, three inch pipe, four inch pipe. You might have something that's a little bit more developed, and you know you wanna include that. So now the model includes that. Also has that flexibility on the operation and maintenance basis. So the user can change all the standard O&M parameters and costs that are used in this cost model. So the cost model gives you a good starting point uh, to say, okay, I don't know a lot other than how many connections I have. Um, well, I thought I had a slide with the, uh, oh, there's the results, yeah. So I, so I don't have a lot of information, but it can give you a quick results. And you can say, yeah, you know what? E1 pressure sewer system does seem feasible compared to the other alternatives. Let me look at that in a little bit more detail. And as you develop those detail, then you can tweak the numbers. You can change the default quantities to what you got from your 30% design and you can change your own m parameters. So that's kind of my quick run through. I, oh, I thought I was running a little bit over, but coming right up on the 10 minute mark. Indeed you are, Keith, thank you. <laughs> all about oh, the pace. All about the pace, my man. Hey, thanks for that um, excellent presentation. And as promised, we'll start uh, right in on our Q&A session. So the first one comes from Chuck. Uh, on life cycle costs, do you set up a normal O&M basis or on a more is needed uh, slash required? Uh, we did a similar system and had to track call outs and O&M for three years uh, as part of the funding requirements. Do you have a standard O&M annual cost to roll into the analysis? You know, we do. Um... And okay, hopefully I don't get, let's see, me. What we do is we kind of set it up with, um, yeah, so here on the screenshot, it might be a little bit small depending on what sort of monitor you have. We do set up some defaults. So we have a lot of case studies that show our mean time between, based on our mean time between service, system would cost, based on call outs, about $35 per year per installed pump. 
Here, I don't know if you can see that, but I have the line item, reactive maintenance equipment replacement. So I'm also including a component in there of about $100 for every, every year for the next um, 15 years or so, so that I can replace that pump. So we have a value in there based on some of our information. If you're out there doing some, looking at all the numbers and you come up with a different value, you can not only you can change that value, but if you look, okay, this is the part where I'm gonna get in trouble. Promise not to yell at me. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pop open the model real quick. So I say I got it. I read that disclaimer. Let me throw in some sample data there. And then, so this is the actual cost model. Hopefully that, first thing you wanna do is show all sheets and make it easier. So you know, let me run over real quick. You can see that on the model parameters, I have the value in there for the cost, but if you have some information based on what you have, you can add that to the cost model. So yeah, there's, there's, it's always gonna be kind of a, as I say, localized and flexible. Okay, very good. Um, next question is, will the life cycle model provide useful cost information if the sewer system design details are not fully developed? Yes, absolutely. So th again, this is the actual model. This is the, the one we have, let me just go back. So I just put in, in our sample data and I'll select all options. I just put in 210 connections with 145 feet between connections. With just that information, you get these results. So this shows you the evaluation. It estimates that the, you see down here, the total pipe length is 22,000 feet. It's the same for all sewer systems. The default costs were adjusted to Schenectady, to New York. That was the zip code I put in there. So it does give you a quick evaluation. And then what you can do um, let's see here, you go, oh, oops, let's see. We go to the capital cost summary. So it develops that cost on these fields based on, as I said, standard system components. If you can go in there, then you can edit it. So if you don't have any information other than the number of connections, you can get these results. And then as you get to the 30%, 50%, 60%, you can go in there and actually change the value. So that's 8,000 change the value. And once you change it there, it is reflected automatically there and is reflected there. So yeah, so the way we set up our cost model is you don't need a lot of information to begin with, but once you do start to get more information, you can change the quantities or even add, add quantities. And we have, that's a lump sum value, and we have one of those. So yeah, you have that flexibility of going from little information into as much as you need. Very good. Um, why aren't engineering and inspection costs included? Oh, they're, they're really not, and they are. I mean, what, depending on how you're doing the evaluation, different utilities are gonna have different requirements. So we set up the life cycle cost model and I grouped that all together um, I'm on parameters one as what we call, as I said, the, um, the project cost. So I have a default set in there of 15%. If you don't want to include the inspection, the engineering, uh, the administration, you can change that to two. Or if you want to include the engineering, but the, just the inspection, you can change that to a smaller value. So we really want to have the flexibility in case the utility or the funding agency says you have to capture all the cost, including the project administration cost, or do not include the cost, you have that flexibility to do it. So here you can see we change that to zero. And then if we go back to the results, um, I saw a quick shift, but let's look at the uh, capital cost summary. You can see that the project costs have been reduced to zero. So it really, it's going to depend on where you are what your uh, utility is telling you you have to do or what the funding agency is telling you what you have to do. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, this next question, can your calculations compare domestic pump systems to gravity systems and local digester systems? I'm sorry, can you, can you give that to me again, Rachel? Sure. Can your calculations compare domestic pump systems to gravity systems and local digester systems. So this person's asking about treatments. Um, 
it's, it's really set up, our cost model is really set up just for the um, collection system alternatives. I suppose if you wanted to, you could probably put in some, uh, let's see, I don't even know why I would do that. Uh, an operation, if you know, you like say for the pressure sewer, you could put in a, you could put a digester cost there at a per annual cost. And then on the gravity sewer field, you could put in a cost there. So that's really the only way you could kind of fudge it in there. The model is set up primarily as a comparison tool between the four different types of sewer systems. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question from George, I've heard that low pressure systems need to be cleaned, pressure cleaned periodically. Is this true? You, you broke up on me, Rachel, unless you said cleaned over five syllables. <laughs> I've heard, sorry, I've heard that low pressure systems need to be cleaned pressure cleaned periodically. Is this true? I would say generally that is not true, but it's not the case for everything. So uh, we would recommend as part of just prudent design that you have terminal clean out so you could flush the systems. But we you know everything, we, we don't get a lot of feedback saying that uh, someone has to flush it on a regular basis. Uh, the only time I might see where that's a, re not a requirement, but that might be good practice. If you have a, um, say it's a new development that has not expanded as quickly as the developer thought it was going to. So the wastewater through the system is going to be slower than anticipated. So your retention times are going to be lower. In that case, you might want to flush the line. But as a general rule, flushing the line is not a re regular requirement. And when it does occur, it's usually because of some unique uh, circumstances. Okay, and uh, you did address this, but we'll answer it again. Um, what do you consider as the project's useful life? I like 30 years. Uh, again, typically, you know, most guidance on life cycle costs will be about 20, 20 to 40 years. But I say the big thing, if you're looking at a life cycle cost evaluation, you want to look at what the regulatory requirements are, because as I say, normally that will be driven by who's ever funding the project. If they're going to give you uh, a 20 year loan, they will want to make sure the project is feasible over that 20 year period. Okay. And thank you for that. Um, no more questions have come in, Keith. You've been very thorough, evidently. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, how about that? Yes, just quickly show you, you know, a couple, couple more points in on the cost model. So this is the actual cost model. As you can see, once I already so, showed you most of the items, but you know, you got your results summary. And then once you got this point, you just hit the print results summary and it gives you eight and a half by 11 results that you can insert right into Appendix C. And I will say this, uh, this is a tool that developed, was developed by E1. The great thing about that is it gives us a lot of flexibility. So I know if you want to put this report in your appendix for your project evaluation, you might not want the manufacturer's logo up there. Please reach out to us. We would be happy to either put in the consultant's logo in there or uh, take the logo out. The only thing we will not do is put in a competitor's logo. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, Keith, do you want to put up your slide with your contact information just one more time for uh, yeah, the good folks? Sure. Um, geez, I'm, let's see. If not, of course, it'll be, con it'll be um, contained in a follow-up email, this, but there it is. Right? So, um, because we're just about out of time here, I just want to say thanks on behalf of all of us at E1. Uh, thanks for joining today's session, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Be well, and Keith, thanks again. Thank you, Rachel.